Good morning, everyone. Hello. Oh, thank you for that, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. It's the last day of the Alps Conference. Welcome back. Um, we had some fantastic sessions yesterday. I've found it wonderful to have a chance to talk to you. My name's Emma, by the way. I am the head of the membership and marketing committee here at, Mal at Alps. Gosh, that wine from last night is already affecting my speech. Um, hope you're all having a wonderful time. We've got even more wonderful sessions for you today. Quick parish notices. If you are staying in the hotel, please make sure you have checked out before the end of the morning coffee break. Luggage may be left securely at reception on the ground floor. Okay. Good. Um, and I will just put a quick plug in for Alps here. If you're feeling, like, as I am, energised by the event, you've got lots of wonderful ideas about how you want to increase collaboration and move the industry forward, then I would urge you to perhaps look at joining one of our special interest groups or even an Alps committee, because without you, we can't move things forward and we want all of your input and inclusion. So. That's my mini Alps plug for you there. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Chris Leonard, who is chairing session number 10, Understanding Research Impact Across the World. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, everyone. Yes, so we have a, a wonderful session lined up for you right now. Um, rather than introduce the speakers myself, the speakers are going to introduce themselves. Uh, and then we're going to have a panel discussion um, around how we understand research impact around the world, how we can affect it, and how we can make it slightly more equitable. Um, there is, uh, oh, there we go, a slide, which <laughs> if I press the right button will work. So I'll start with myself. I'm Chris Leonard uh, from Cactus Communications. I have worked in various publishers uh, in various countries around the world, and I certainly have some insight into how research from outside the Western world is perceived. Um, my areas of interest nicely coincide with one of our panelists. Um, so, Mercury, if you would like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's really nice to be here this morning. Uh, I, I, have, I, I, I almost thought I wouldn't make it in time, so I'm really happy to be here. Like uh, my, <laughs> name, <laughs> my name is Mercury Shitindo. I am here today courtesy of uh, being a founding member or co-founder of Africa Journal of Bioethics and also the co-editor-in-chief for Africa Journal of Bioethics. And apart from that, I am also uh, the chair and uh, executive director for Africa Bioethics Network. And uh, uh, the reason why I'm holding those hats is because I'm a bioethicist and also a researcher. I'm based in Kenya, and I'm glad to be here today. So uh, a bit or what some of the things or the reasons as to why I do uh, the work that I do is because I, I came to a point where I realized we have a, a lot of gaps in uh, the work that is being done and we needed to find a way of making things inclusive, being able to create a space uh, where we can make uh, it possible for researchers from Africa who are not able to afford uh, the, like the publication fees, uh, if they do not have uh, scholarships or funding, to be able to have a space where they can be able to do this and be able to see how we can also uh, promote research visibility. That was the idea behind uh, uh, the formation of the journal. So uh, apart from that, uh, as you can see from the slide, I, I do try in small ways here and there to see how we can be able to uh, promote this and be able to to make uh, you know, the impact of research felt more in Africa. So Wonderful. we'll still hear more as we <laughs> continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mercury. Um, Tamika, if you would like to go next. Great, thank you. Uh, so um, I come from Melbourne, Australia. You can probably tell from the accent. Uh, so came a long way to be here. And my first Alps, which is amazing. Um, I didn't even know this community existed, and it's a beautiful community. So thank you for everyone being so welcoming. Uh, my um, 
my background. Uh, I was an academic and I used to be in that world of publishing, so you know, if I don't like you a little bit, it might be why. <laughs> uh, but now my, um, my day job and my, my life is revolved around research impact. So for the last 10 years, I've been heading up the Research Impact Academy based in Melbourne, Australia. And we work with academics, um, universities, research institutes, governments, uh, non-profits all around the world to help them to understand what impact is, how to create impact, how to communicate that impact, and how to capture the impact. And I'm particularly interested in these things that I've listed here on the slide. I think we're going to talk a bit more about them, so I won't kind of steal uh, Chris's thunder here. But um, uh, you know, visibility of our research. So more and more, I'm sort of seeing that a lot of the people we work with are publishing but the work they're publishing isn't getting the visibility. So that's a big one for me to think about how do we, how do, we do that, and I think it's a relevant conversation for here. Uh, the, the next one for me is how can we be more equitable around uh, assessing impact? We love to talk about economic impact. I know in Australia our government loves to talk about numbers and dashboards, but I think we've, there's you know, more to it than that. Uh, and also I'm really interested in AI and impact, so I'm sure we're gonna talk a bit about that as well. So um, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tamika. And next, Kathleen. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Kathleen Shearer. I'm the executive director of CORE, which is the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. Um, the organization was launched in 2009 to really develop and advance a global repository network around the world to provide open access to research outputs. So not just articles, but research data and so on. And um, we've had a lot of international experience in terms of how to be able to connect infrastructure from different regions with each other in an environment where there's very different resources on the ground. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to bring today some of my lessons learned around how we've been um, trying to connect and create this global knowledge commons. Um, in, a, in an environment where, um, again, um, the needs and the requirements and the resources are very different across the world. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So hopefully uh, you've met our panelists now. I'm aware it's a very broad subject uh, to be covering in a, a, an hour. <laughs> we probably are not going to scratch every, every itch that you are thinking of. So it's our intention to have a discussion for about half an hour and then to leave ample time at the end for questions. And if there's an aspect of uh, research impact around the world that we haven't covered, that's your opportunity to jump in. So I'm, I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists, what do we mean when we're talking about global impact of research? How do we define that <coughs> concept? <laughs> Who would like to go first? <laughs> I'm happy to start. <laughs> okay. Uh, so really, it's, it's a massive question. I think there's a lot of definitions around impact around the world, um, different definitions in every country. Uh, in Australia, we actually have two, so you know, um, the, the government's really <laughs> thinking about this in two different ways. Uh, so I think how we define that and how we understand impact around the world globally really depends on the environment and the context you're working in. And for every single person, that context is different. Even, e even within the one country, it's different. So um, I think it's really all about uh, the context of what you're doing, the context of what you're hoping to achieve, the context of the impact that's relevant mm -hmm. um, or appropriate to, the, to what it is that's being worked on or even what the output looks like. Um, I know in Australia, one of the things I actually like about our context of impact is that we include knowledge impact. So rather than just external to academia, which if you look at something like the UK REF, uh, we are very inclusive. And so one of our major funders included this uh, category of knowledge impact, which is more than just citations, uh, but it's all about the impact of the knowledge being generated. It's one of the biggest things that we do when we work with fundamental scientists. And it's one of the biggest reasons I think that we can redefine impact to make it much more inclusive from all the way from fundamental basic science, all the way through to applied uh, practical um, sort of uh, practice-based research. So um, for me, that 
inclusion of that definition in Australia is one of the things that I'm kind of really keen to see happen more, more broadly across the globe. Mm -hmm. I'll pass on. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the perspective around what is considered research impact is expanding. Um, 10 years ago, it was completely measured by high impact factor, uh, where you publish and how many citations you receive. So the downstream impact was, was not, um, shall we say, taken into account as much as it should have been. Um, I sort of live in the upstream part of the, uh, of the um, process of, of, of research dissemination and I think there's a, a really serious issue with um, visibility of certain research publications and especially in developing countries and because of that the, the impact of, of some research is really diminished. So um, I don't know if any of you saw the um, report that was published, it was commissioned by Coalition S and published in 2020 about diamond open access journals. So they um, concluded that there are like 29,000 diamond open access journals around the world. And very few of those journals, about 10,000 of them are indexed in directory of open access journal and even fewer are indexed in the Web of Science and Scopus. Mm -hmm. Yet many countries still use Web of Science and Scopus to have an understanding of the research output in their country. So we have all this really invisible literature out there that's probably very important, that might be published in different languages, that is not being taken into account when we do our analytics of, of um, research outputs in, in various countries. So mm -hmm. I think from my perspective, um, that's a place where we would like to improve the current situation mm -hmm. and also in increase the visibility of that literature without having to move all of that literature onto like international publication venues because the bibliodiversity, local journals are actually very, very important in many, many countries. Sure. And Mercury, same question to you. What does research impact mean for you? Uh, well, from, from my perspective, apart from what they have said, uh, I would look at it from the angle of uh, what does the research uh, eventually lead to? Uh, what does it, what is its usability? Like at the end of the day, uh, was the research just done to be published for reading sake, or uh, is it supposed to have some value in terms of the society? And uh, one of the, the areas that I normally find uh, to be uh, concerning is the fact that um, uh, most of the research that we see out here is not really applicable locally, but it, is, it could be applicable in other settings, so it can be considered global. But at the end of the day, it's not really responsive to whatever needs uh, that would be. Mm -hmm. So we, we can look at it from the, uh, from the point of where do we, when you're starting your research, why were you doing it? So what is it responding to? What, yeah. is, it, what is it supposed to, to, to uh, like achieve in the long run so that you can be able to measure its impact uh, you know, with, with whatever it has been able to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think um, the way we have traditionally measured impact have stemmed from uh, things like library tools, which were meant to, to manage <laughs> subscriptions and things like this. So if we were to um, imagine things like impact factor hadn't ever happened, how would we go about defining a way for us to measure the impact of all research around the world, not just necessarily stuff that is done. Let's say medical research in a Western hospital may not necessarily be relevant to a, a rural doctor operating in Sri Lanka. And their research equally may not be um, relevant to uh, someone working in a Western hospital. How do we think about impact in a way which means all research can be
considered impactful in its own way. Do you want me to go? Please. Uh, okay. Um, I, I love this question. Uh, I think there's a couple of things that you mentioned there around if we didn't have impact factor and we hadn't gone down that road. And I wonder if we would have stayed with just counts of publications. I don't know, you know, I think um, one of the things we have to acknowledge is that people have been having these external impacts for a long time. It's not that we just decided, oh, we better make a difference with our research. I actually want to acknowledge that we are making a difference. Uh, I think the thing that's happened is that governments have come along, and I kind of blame the internet because I'm a bit of a thinker around this, and I think now transparency is the thing. So now it's suddenly, oh, people know what we spend our money on. We need to be able to show that what we're spending our money on is of value to people. It's not to say it never was. It's just to say now we need to actually show that it is and prove that it is. And that's led this agenda. So I think that's really important. And so when you're talking about that sort of impact factor thing, I think maybe we wouldn't have come up with this because I think it's been an external driver for that. In terms of how we can have more impact across the board, I think the way that I like to, to think about it, and we actually, you know, we, we developed a model that we use when we work with people, and essentially, for me, impact is any movement that happens beyond the original project. So I don't, I don't count, because we work with a lot of people on their grants, and people will say, oh, you know, I published this, and then I got more funding to do another study. That's impact. It's <laughs> like, well, it's impact on your career, but, you know, it's business as usual, so, <laughs> okay, well done. Um, but ultimately, if, and I, so the word I like to put in there is other. So has our work influenced, informed, or been used, adopted, or adapted by others in some way, in any way? Has it had any kind of messaging or influence in any way on someone else? And to me, that would be the simplest way of saying this is all inclusive of impact. Yeah. I'll pass on. Yeah, and I, I think it's very important to um, recognize that you can have a big impact with a very small community, and that's very different than having a, an impact, you know, a small impact with a large number of of, uh, a, a, you know, at the global level. And those impacts, you know, with a very small community are equally as important uh, sometimes. So I don't know, M pox in, in, in Africa or um, mountain disease in Nepal. I mean, they, they specialize in Nepal in research in mountain disease, but, you know, that kind of research is not really high, high altitude disease, you know. But that uh, research is not really applicable for many other countries. So I think we need to be very flexible in terms of how, how we measure impact. And um, it also is part of the, the, you know, what type of research you're doing as well. Some, some very practical research leads to, you know, changes in, in practice. And then others is very, you know, um, blue sky sort of. So I, I think we need to have a really multifactorial, uh, flexible way of looking at how, how, how we measure impact. Yeah. Yeah. Or how we document it, because maybe measuring it is not mm. even the right. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. You must have seen mine. Next question. But, um, <laughs> Mercury, yeah, if we were starting from scratch, again, what factors are important, do you think, when we are considering research impact? I won't look at it from a multi-pronged approach where we, we consider it from uh, the beginning. Like, what is the why? We have different stakeholders. Like, for, for example, we, we, we have the researchers, we have the, the publishers, or the, the, we have the academia, like the, uh, where we have a lot of dissemination. We also have the consumers or people who will either implement so when we start uh, from the inception where you ask the question, why are you doing this? And you're able to get that particular answer, you'll be able to know what, what kind of impact are you looking at. Of course, you might have other things which might come out of this which would still be impactful, but you, you must go into it knowing exactly what do you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I feel sometimes uh, we, we do not prioritize that. We, we will prioritize being indexed, you know, uh, publishing in a particular journal, which is good, 
and uh, we want to we want to do that thing that is uh, uh, like branding, for example, and then we end up missing the point. So most of the time, the the, the kind of impact that is being measured is not the impact. It, it's it's half, or I, I would say I would say it's uh, it's half baked because it's not considering everything. Meaning that uh, most of the time. Uh, if I come to you to look maybe at uh, what you have published, I will leave it at uh, knowing, uh, I will ask you some questions about where have you published, are you indexed. Whatever answer you give me will determine if I'm actually going to, to read or give it attention or not, meaning that I might miss out on information that you might be having that would be useful for me. Mm -hmm. So. When we are talking about measuring impact, I feel we need to we need to redefine how how that's how that's done. So it was interesting you you used the word measuring there. <laughs> I mean we live in a world where everything is metricized and yeah. we assign n numbers to things in order to evaluate them. I think there was. Uh, an attempt to move away from some of that within the UK with the, the, the ref exercise, let's say. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not sure it made anyone's lives easier. <laughs> um, do you think there's a role for uh, measuring everything? Do we need to assign a numerical value to, to impact? Uh, and if not, how do we quickly ascertain whether someone or something is worth investigating further. So for instance, now we have a, a journal brand as a proxy for um, how selective the editors <laughs> have been with an article, so we know what kind of level it's at. If we don't have, uh, if we haven't got that, how do we define impact? Do we need to measure impact is my ultimate question, or is there another way to define and share impact? Uh, okay, I'll just go. Uh, from what I had just said, when we go to the why, we would already know how we need to measure, because uh, not everything is measurable, mm -hmm. uh, so we might not have a specific metric. But if you are able to answer the why, you'd actually be able to say, uh, I intended to do ABCD, and these were the outcomes. I was able to do this. Uh, even, if you were, if you, even if you did not achieve what you wanted to achieve, there will be some learnings in there. Like, if you do this, it won't work. That's already impact, because you've already saved somebody else from needing to do the same thing, mm -hmm. to try to get the same solution. So I feel that we, we really miss it out at the beginning, because most people just do this for, for the career, which is good. I want it also for myself, for my career, but then you must always have the why. So this takes us back to still uh, in academia. What do we learn in, uh, what do we learn in school? Uh, what is the purpose of uh, publications? So if we are able to get that right, then I would know if I'm going to do this, these are the things, this, this is the, this is the end, end point or end game. So uh, if you have that right, you'd be able to actually know this is what you're going to look, this is your impact factor, this is what you're, if something needs to be measured, mm -hmm. uh, you would know what needs to be measured. And um, uh, we, apart from the just uh, like the, the journals, publishers, we need to have other factors that we need to be looking out for uh, in terms of uh, looking at impact. Yeah. Um, a hybrid quantitative qualitative appro approach, is that right? I, I mean, I would say that the focus on impact factors has been very bad for um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in scholarly publishing. And so I think my feeling is that we really need to move away from counting things, and we need to ask researchers to describe what their impact is, which is, I think, what Tamika kind mm -hmm. of works with them on. 
um, because, um, again, what it has created is these kind of perverse incentives for researchers to publish in international journals, which means that often they're, they're doing research in areas that are not as relevant for their own local environment or their local communities. So my feeling is we, we've gone too far. Uh, we need to move away from that, and we need to create you know, frameworks that allow researchers to articulate in a more narrative way how, they are, um, how their research is having an impact on, on their communities or other researchers or you know, mm -hmm. um, whoever. So. Yeah. Mm, I agree with both of you. I think you know, the thing I was thinking about as you were sort of talking is um, with, uh, so um, a lot of, in Australia, one of our funders that actually introduced this knowledge impact uh, thing has signed up to DORA, so they're not actually allowed to use impact factors at all, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a really good movement. I think there's another one now, I can't remember the, uh, the acronym, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but one of the things, I think that we do need qualitative and quantitative. I come from a STEM background, so automatically I always go to quantitative, which is an issue, and so I'll be talking to someone in the arts and I'll go, is there a proxy for behavior? Is there a proxy for awareness? <laughs> um, there's gotta be something we can nu numericalize this, you know, if that's a word. Um, and so I think having some indicators around that, but what I think becomes an issue is that when we do do these really um, great statements that you see in the ref where people can write about their qualitative and their quantitative types of impact, um, I think peer review becomes the issue because what I see with, we, we do a lot of case studies for, for grants because people have to do it in their track records. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, reviewers see something big in terms of numbers as being more impactful. And that's when we become, we move into problems. So people say to me, but if I haven't had a big impact, it's not you know, worth as much as someone who's had a small impact. And I kind of go back to the impact is impact. Mm -hmm. Plus I hate the word measure, so assess is what we always say because people like it a bit more. <laughs> but um, so for me, that's where I kind of go to that model of has the work had an influence? Has it been adopted? Has it been adapted by someone else for some reason? And if that's the case, you kind of meet the brief. And then the next, so you know, I have two questions. The first is who used or was influenced by your work? The second question is, so what? And if you can answer those two questions, you've had impact. To me, it doesn't matter if your impact impacted the entire globe versus it impacted a small community in a, in a, a, a lower socioeconomic area or something. Um, so it really, um, you know, for me, it's, uh, can we show movement across that pathway versus you've had more impact so you score better than that person because as we know and as we've sort of talked about here, you can have a really large impact on a very small community but because it's a small community doesn't make it less important than something that's global. Um, so I think for me that's definitely um, the thing around how we, how we do that. So it comes back to how do we assess it and how do we understand the why, and I think the why is really, really key mm -hmm. to this, mm -hmm. and asking that. And I was just sort of thinking about that from a publisher perspective as, as you were talking, and I was thinking, you know, maybe for every single journal article that gets sort of submitted, can you just ask them in one, you know, in one line, tell us why you did this work? Um, you know, because a lot of them probably couldn't actually answer that, to be honest. <laughs> can I just add one thing to the conversation? I think what's happened is it's become, you know, our research assessment systems have become so global that the people who are doing the assessment don't understand the research that, you know, that's articulated in the article. So they need, they have typically needed this kind of proxy to be right. able to decide, so, yeah. oh, it was published in Science or Nature, therefore it must be, you know, really good uh, research or highly impactful research. So, um, uh, you know, I think we kind of need to move back again to the community-based evaluation of research, where researchers who are a part of that community can evaluate also. And I mean, that's what peer review is, mm -hmm. but right now peer review is, is not available. So I think we're also seeing a movement where, uh, towards open peer review, so that if you are not non-specialist, you can still read the reviews, you have um, more information to be able to make an assessment on the value of the research in the article rather than using the journal name as, as, a, mm. as a proxy for. Can I add to that? Please. 
Um, I agree from a publishing point of view and from a very academic point of view. But the other thing, when we start to get to the downstream impact, I like the way that you talked about that. Um, it's, you know, one of the, my favorite things that someone once said and has really stuck with me is that impact happens at the level of the user. So the people who should be asked and who should be reviewing that are the users. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing something that's going to influence industry, they should be peer reviewing it, not an academic. And that's where we run into trouble because we have academics reviewing a lot of these case studies that get written. And when someone has a social impact, an academic just goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> Where's the numbers? Especially in the health and medicine area, they're like, who cares that you had this social impact, you know? So where's your, where's your article in uh, brain or in cell? Um, so that, that becomes a problem on the other side. So I think you need a mix of both. Yeah. Um, I just want to go back to something you said, Kathleen, about the dominant um, uh, established Western ways of measuring impact has been detrimental to up and coming research economies, yeah. let's say. In what ways has it been detrimental, sp specifically? Yeah, I mean, I could point to a couple of things. One is that, again, if you want to publish in international journals, you need to do research that is of relevance to the international community, right. which may take your research away from something working on local problems. Mm -hmm. But I guess the other point that I think is really important and um, has been expressed by um, the Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism um, is that publishing in English, because this is also um, these international journals, as you all know, typically publish in English. It's one of the main factors why local publications do not um, you know, impact the um, country that is funding that research. So I think there is a big issue in terms of public access to research in different countries because it's being published in international journals mm -hmm. in, in English, uh, because those researchers are, are chasing, are being incentivized to publish there mm -hmm. by their, you know, by their research agencies. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a, um, it's, it's quite a problem and I think Again, like it's partly because we're using journals as a proxy for, for measuring impact and we need to sort of really look at that in a more holistic, holistic way. So the, um, you know, the multilingual aspect of, uh, or the lack of multilingualism in story <coughs> publishing is, is a real issue. And I know, um, I haven't heard lately about um, the policy in China, but a couple of years ago they had they very much moved away from um, incentivizing high impact factor journal publishing, although I think they still do, and they have required now that Chinese researchers publish in Chinese, in Chinese journals. So I think we're starting to see a change also at the level of policy makers mm -hmm. to recognize that this is a, an important issue. Is there not a danger of siloing information yeah. in, well, in my case? That's exactly what we have to, that's why we need to build international infrastructure. That's why we shouldn't be incentivizing a handful, well, you know, the, just um, these uh, international journals that have been, you know, that are run by international companies. We need to create internationally interoperable infrastructure that can support the needs of different countries, different languages, um, different types of research outputs. Mm -hmm. So I think that's our challenge in the next 10 to 20 years is to try to move in that direction. So this seems like an opportune moment to do a good job as a chair of this session and ask, can we see any role for AI in improving <laughs> research impact here? In, in, in publishing or health, healthcare? Uh, in impact of research defined how, yeah. how however you wish. Mm. Okay, I haven't understood, but I would want to add something to what she okay. she has said about the the international journals and some of the issues that brings uh, 
like from uh, from uh, the experience from let's say from Africa, you find that most people or most researchers would have to look for a first author from uh, okay. from a Western uh, country. So that first and foremost, uh, when you're doing peer reviewing, some of the lessons that we teach is the bias. Uh, there is bias, like when somebody is actually reviewing your paper, once they read your name and where you are from, they, you have higher chances of being rejected. But if you attach yourself with Chris, for example, first author, Mercury is also there somewhere, the chances, some, some of the, the reviewers might not even really read through. Uh, they will assume that this is already a good paper, so you'll go through. So those are some of the small challenges that are there, and uh, that's why we are also fighting to see if there's space for other upcoming journals. But then the challenge that is still there is that most journals which are also upcoming, we have journals maybe which have ethical issues or integrity issues, but then small journals which are also coming up which have integrity would also be put and the journals which are called Predator. I, I got this from another conference I attended for, for Library Association uh, for in Africa, yeah. where they were saying, if you are small and upcoming and trying to get yourself out there, you will be labeled as a Predator journal, meaning that people will not publish. They would prefer to, to publish in a journal which is known than uh, come to that journal. Now, the challenge is that most of the journals which are known would require a lot of money. And, and, and I know uh, Jake mentioned like a month's salary, but I can assure you for most people, it's a whole year's salary. Mm -hmm. So how do you do it? So you sit on your research, you're always praying, looking, you're, it's like you're begging, they're looking for somebody to sponsor you. But then that means your research is not mm -hmm. doing what it's supposed to do. So we want to be able to move away from that, even though we have to also recognize that uh, the people who do the work need to be, need to be also paid, that, that there has to be some resources. So how do you balance that? That's more of a question than actually an answer. Wow. <laughs> that was very insightful, thank you. I mean, it certainly uh, echoes some of my ex ex experience when uh, we're working in Qatar to set up the publishing of operation. Nobody wanted to submit because we were in Qatar, therefore predatory. N nobody wanted to review <laughs> because we were new. So yeah, I, I understand uh, some of those uh, issues. The problem about um, uh, the bias against author names seems more serious. And I wonder if reforming some aspects of peer review would be one of the first steps, one of the first practical steps we could take to making impact, research impact more equitable. So if we had a, a double blind review process where the reviewers don't know who the authors are, maybe that could be a practical thing we could that start. That could be helpful, but then also some of the trainings that we do is to train peer reviewers how to not be biased. Most of the bias is not uh, intentional, actually. Mm. It's just like when you're brought for a paper that is written in good English, it, has a, it doesn't matter the, uh, the, the science, there's a higher chance that it will, be, uh, it will be, have better risk acceptance than for somebody who English is not it's their yeah. first language. So well, some of the things that we are also training would be like when you, you remove some of the biases, meaning that do not be so keen on how the English is but the science uh, in whatever you're doing. So we, we have, I believe what would help is what she said. We, if we have some framework, international framework, for example, that is applicable across board, however, there is also a catch-22. It can be applicable across board, but it also has to consider the different, uh, like, uh, uh, local co context, Context that we have across the world, mm -hmm. which would include language, which could also include resources and uh, things like that. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, I promised to leave some time at the end for questions, and that's exactly what we 
will do now. Um, I just want to check first, Godwin's, were there any online questions to raise? Oh, great. So if we could get the mics out, and uh, if you have uh, a question for the panel, please raise your hands and we'll get a microphone to you. Chris, can I um, just respond to your last question? Because yeah. we didn't really address it about artificial intelligence. Yes. Because I think some of are some things, some of the artificial intelligence tools can be very helpful in terms of bridging uh, some of these barriers that we have right now, in particular language. Mm -hmm. So allowing people to publish in their own language, which means they are actually able to articulate well, and then using artificial intelligence tools, for example, to translate, say, the abstract, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe we don't want to translate the full article yet because we're not, we don't trust that. So I think there, there are a lot of tools that are being developed now and becoming very good that can help us, uh, bridge some of those barriers. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah. a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other roles for AI to play here? I guess my particular interest is around how it can make peer review more uh, quicker and unbiased. Uh, I think we're still probably a little way off that yet, but um, are there any uh, other ways we can think about AI being used here? Tamika, I'm mm. looking at you in particular. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> mine's more from the side of, I don't think it's there for um, peer review, um, essentially, completely. Uh, it may be a, a good starting point because everyone like, likes a shortcut. Uh, I think from my perspective, I'm looking at AI from the point of view of how do we use it as a brainstorming tool mm -hmm. so that people can think about what's the impact of what I'm doing, mm -hmm. how might I pitch that. In terms of, you know, so there's different things you can do across different areas of your, um, your pipeline of research. So essentially at the beginning, maybe using AI to brainstorm potential impact, uh, potential next users or people who might be influenced by what it is you're intending to do. Um, during the research to um, you know, uh, generate summaries of work or different things. Um, there's so many ways you can use this. Um, but maybe in, at the end, um, you know, one of the things that I always kind of think is everyone likes to talk about public access of research, but the public don't actually read journal articles. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep that in mind. So how do we maybe use AI in a way to summarize articles, to put out little snippets, to make things much more accessible to different audiences? So I think there's a real avenue there, whether it's you know, um, using AI to, to summarize, to make little vid vign uh, vignettes, if you like, of different elements of papers, um, because we actually have to put a whole raft of things around the publication to market the publication to the relevant audiences, because publications of, in and of themselves are actually academic outputs for other academics. Um, you know, people like to think that policymakers are sitting in an armchair, smoking a pipe, reading your journal article. It just doesn't happen that way. You know, um, sorry, they're not spending time doing that. Um, so how do we put something next to that? So maybe that's where AI can, can be of use. Mm -hmm. I know there was a question down the back too. So. Yeah, lovely. Um, so if we could have hands up, please, and we'll get a microphone to you uh, over here, please. This one, Shoot, somebody's already got Yep, thank you. Joe Wixon of Wiley, but also speaking as an SDG Publishers Compact Fellow. We're really interested in this translation of research into something that can be used by people beyond academia as well as other scientists. And so what we're finding is that the abstracts are frequently not written in, a, in anything like a digestible way and often don't even mention, as you were touching on, Tamika, where it could be applied. And so that's a kind of area we've been working on a lot. I think AI can play a role there because it can sometimes sift that out from a paper that where it may not have been the top of mind for the research themselves. So we've seen some good results there. There was a study where I think patients preferred the AI started and author checked, I should say, summaries over those by the senior consultant geriatric <laughs> uh, clinicians. So uh, yeah, th there's, there's some work to be done there, I think. Um, but the other angle I liked that you touched on to me, because you kind of answered my question as, <laughs> as I was waiting, so great job, um, was where you were talking about the front end and saying, thinking about it earlier. One of the other things that we're really interested in is convincing researchers to 
reach out to communities and find out where there are knowledge gaps and orient their research to match. In the SDG space, that's a very painful gap right now. Is there anything you would add on that side or any, any work or ideas or suggestions any of you have in that space? I think it sort of speaks to uh, what Mercury was saying about why you're doing this research. And it's the number one question I always ask people that come and work with me. Tell me why you're doing this. And I often get a blank look um, because I'm interested or because my last study showed this. It's like, so what? Um, they don't like that answer, but I'm a bit... Uh, people like that I'm blunt sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> I, well, they tell me that anyway. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, knowing where those gaps are. But the, the, the issue that you come up against is, but Tamika, where's discovery science going to go? Because we need to do things because it's just something that we want to discover. And it's like, yeah, absolutely, there's a, there's a space for that. But there's also a space for how is this relevant? And I often get people say, well, I don't actually care what they think. I want to do it this way anyway. And it's like, mm -hmm. but if you really want something to change, I'm sorry, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I always say to people, when you start your project, it is a draft. Go talk to people and say, I have a draft, but I want to frame it around what is important to you. So yeah, mm -hmm. good question though. I'm glad I answered the other one. I was right in tune. <laughs> <laughs> Telepathic. Um, more questions? Yes, uh, on the end. Thank you. Um, my name is Laura Henderson. Um, I work with Frontiers for Young Minds, which is a science journal for kids. So we measure our impact um, in public use um, because that is literally who we're aiming for. We're not aiming for researchers talking to researchers. Um, so, um, but we have a funding crisis in, in universities uh, across the world. So um, it, research impact is used as a proxy, uh, the metrics that we see commonly these days, as a way to reallocate funding for the next round of funding grants. Um, I loved the question, the, uh, the discussion around those two key questions, you know, sort of, um, who have you impacted and so what? I completely agree with that. How can we help to bring a qualitative uh, assessment of impact like that into a fair assessment system for reallocation of grants? Because that is a very, very big step um, that is still needed if we are to come to a fairer sense of impact. Can I? Um, uh, what I know most funders are doing now, they are moving away from uh, the model of uh, looking at the impact to uh, evidence-based uh, you know, decisions whereby you would have to go uh, to show that there's evidence like you would have to actually carry out research to say that you need to do research for, uh, for something else. So the first research would be mostly considered as a pilot most of the time, or, but you would need to prove that there's this particular need so that even when you're doing your fund reallocation, that you, you are, you're doing it based on, it, it is responsive to the needs of the community. And uh, but you will realize most of the big funders who, uh, who, are, who normally like, give a lot of money, they, they would require that you have some sort of community community engagement, which would have brought in the, the aspect of uh, making it responsive. Otherwise, uh, why are you doing it in the first place if it is not going to, to, to and if you're talking about uh, research impact, it means that um, whatever had already been impacted does not need to be funded anymore. So maybe if you have any other issue, or you're maybe asking for additional funding, uh, to increase the impact, then you still have evidence to show that you need more funding to continue the work that you're doing. So I, I believe that uh, unless the, the funders don't believe in that particular model, they should be able to, to adopt an evidence-based approach. You want to answer? Um, I guess from my perspective, I would say that I'm going to circle back to peer review of, funder, of funding applications is an issue. Uh, that's what we see. So I, would, I jumped up and down with you know, um, delight when our health and medical funder in Australia said, we want you to, we, we don't care about impact factors, we signed up to Dora, now we want you to tell us about your top 10 publications and we want you to tell us why you picked them, not just because I've got the highest sites. We also want you to write an impact case study and I was like, great. 
but then the people who review the impact case studies know nothing about what impact is. And I can still tell you that the person who has the cell publication or the brain publication gets the comment with great impact. Mm -hmm. No one's used that work. It's like had two sites. But you know, um, so yeah, it's not impact. So I think the peer review is one issue. But the other thing I'll say, and I'm not sure which funders exactly because all funders are different. We've done quite a bit of work with funders who are small NGO kind of donor organisations who will say, we have to be able to justify to our donors that the money we spend is spent responsibly. And in order to do that, we want you to help us, so we, we help them, to build frameworks around how to put impact into the proposal, how to put impact into the ongoing reporting, and how to put impact into the peer review. And that's been really good. But when it comes to big government funders, that's harder. But what I would suggest is just keep, keep at it, you know, we have to. And, and it did happen for one of our big funders. Um, I think they keep saying, oh, it's not working. I don't think they realise that the reason it's not working is because the peer reviewers haven't been trained in impact. Um, so we have to just, I, I guess it's coming. Um, but at the end of the day, I agree exactly with Mercury as well. If you're able to show that you have impact, you can keep money going into the system. So yes, universities are lacking in money around the globe. Um, funders are, you know, countries don't want to fund as much research. But when COVID hit, I said to people, you know what, the UK is well positioned. They can wheel out their case studies and they can say, look at the amount of impact that we've had from putting money into research. So the government will never stop putting money in because you can say, look at what we've done. Australia, we had nothing like that. And it was like our universities were jumping up and down going, someone needs to support us. And I said, instead of saying, give us money, you need to be jumping up and down going, because we created Wi-Fi, you can work at home. <laughs> and because we created this, we've now got vaccines. And, you know, but they weren't doing that. Yeah. So I think they're a victim of their own um, ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we've gone too narrow with that we've done excellent research and high quality research, but to the people who fund that, government, to industry, to the public, they don't care about that stuff. Um, yes, it needs to be high quality, but they just, for them, it's like, how have you changed my life day to day? Mm -hmm. yep. Just a, something small to add to that because um, I've been part of enough um, European Commission proposals mm -hmm. where they have the section on KPIs. <laughs> and you know, you, you, you can see researchers putting themselves in a knot to identify particular KPIs, which is a section in the, in the proposal where you're talking about your, your impact and how you're gonna count your <laughs> impact. But, um, so I think funders, you know, are, they're aware that they, that they, they want to you know, evaluate the potential impact and they want um, research projects to be able to document their impact, but I think there's still a disconnect, as you say, between real impact and what is being measured or potentially measured through mm -hmm. the project. Yep. Great. Um, any other questions? Yes, uh, at the front here, please. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maria, I'm from PLOS. Um, so Mercury raised a really interesting point earlier where you're saying if you're doing research and it is not working out, then you know, you're still having impact by stopping someone else from spending time and resource doing work that doesn't work, which is a very important part. The negative data are a very big part of our, of our data. Um, but how do we measure the impact on how many people are now not spending time and not spending resource because of the negative data that you publish. Because that's a very important impact, yeah. but how do we measure that? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to answer? That? Sounds like a question I get in a workshop where I go, well, let's talk about that in the break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe you um, can speak about it over coffee. <laughs> or, or an alcoholic drink, I think. Um, absolutely. Look, uh, I think you can, you can actually report on it and you can write about it, it's hard. But you have to do a bit of a reverse analysis, so it takes a lot of work. Because you've got to say, what have we been doing all this time? So from a medical standpoint, for example, because it's easy, we've been doing this therapy for years and this many people have been treated using this therapy over the 10 years we've been doing it. And your research has shown that actually we shouldn't be doing that or even um, it's shown that 
uh, that what we're doing works. So what we have to do is go, okay, well, because we know now that that actually works and it's definitive, we know that this many people have been treated correctly. Or if it's actually negative, we have to say, oh, this has been bad for this many people, so now we need to change it. So you need to paint the picture in a way that sort of leads to the change. It's, it's, it's tricky because it's almost like a study in itself, right? Um, and, and again, this is the thing, and this is why I love impact and everyone else hates it, is that it's, it's creative, it's come up with a, an idea. What might it look like? How might we explain that? How might we show that? And you've got to kind of brainstorm a little bit and go, what's a really good way we could actually measure that or go back and assess that or find something to, to, to articulate that in a way that's clear and wanted by that particular audience? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Are there any, there is one more question at the front here. Can we get a mic at the front? Oh, there's one here, that's right. <laughs> it's a fairly broad question, I guess, but um, it, it feels like well, there's lots of different places where reporting impact is important, but using the umbrella term impact, it seems like it's covering quite a lot of different audiences, actually. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask, do you think there is one particular audience we should be communicating impact with the most? Or, in fact, do we need to look at ways to separate out the different audiences and tackle those in different ways? I, I believe the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, like stakeholder uh, that people look at is the consumer. The question why most of the time we'll always talk about the person who's going to, to use the information, it could actually be that the government uh, needs to know if they should follow this particular, uh, the, if, if they should do this uh, implement, they should do a particular intervention or not. Or it can be just the community, you've gone, you've taken there an intervention. So I, I don't think we should say we are categorizing specifically, mm. because uh, what has come out of all this is that we need to start with the why or who and so on. Meaning that if we are able to answer that, then we would know who is the focus and what is the focus uh, in terms of uh, the impact. So we cannot say that we have specific audiences. And from the study which is already coming out uh, from the, that study of learning what did not work, that would have a different audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Wonderful. Well, I think we're almost at the end of the oh, session. Is there an online one? Sorry? Is there any? Oh, there was one online question. It's not no, online, it's please. It's just it's me. A good one. Oh, I'm, I'm, not to, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to speak, but I have to. Um, I think um, just to respond to um, the question that Abigail, sorry, Emma asked, um, the, my background is in um, public health. And when I worked in public health, uh, I worked as a uh, patient's engagement. So one of the things we did, and this is in UK, um, I did with researchers, is say, uh, patients are tired of feeding into your research because they don't know what is going on. So I did uh, a, a system where uh, researchers from the University Teaching Hospital in Hackney, in UCL, they agreed to meet with patients before they set up with their research. And they promised me a, uh, an engagement over time, which includes they will come back at the end to meet patients to say, this is what this research we've done, this is the outcome of it. Mm -hmm. Research is easy to interpret or to translate into minutia where patients can actually know what has happened. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a big task because I worked as an independent person convincing all these researchers, but they bought into it. And the feedback was great because at the end of three years, sometimes it's like three, four years to come back. Sometimes it's not the same set of patients anymore. But at the end of the day, there's an appreciation to say, okay, so you asked me this question four years ago, and this is what has come out of it. But it also changed the way that they did research because they then were looking at, we have to go back to this place yeah. and we have to say something. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm quite serious about it. I talk to them all of the time. But it's not just that two visits. In between, they come back for feedback mm -hmm. all of the time. We did one research on impact of um, uh, cancer on HIV patients. And that ran for about three, four years. 
even when I've stopped doing this work, we still worked on it to call the patients together. So it does happen that, that the impact is measured at that point. And they were then using it with the university teaching hospitals to do the next level because then they will say, we've talked to the patients and this is what has come out of it. So um, I'm new in this industry and I found it bizarre that scientists who should rely on evidence are just running around counting beans and saying, well, I've published one more article, thank you, let me do the next one. Um, it, it's doable, it's just that it seems nobody wants to do it and I found it you know, um, unhelpful in, in every way. Great. Thank you, Godwins. Um, we are unfortunately going to have to wrap up on that point. So, would you just like to say thank you to our, our wonderful panelists for the session? Today.